You may be seated. Could the children please come forward? All right. How's it going, my friends? How's it going? All right. When you were little, were you ever afraid of the dark? Maybe. I used to live, uh, uh, my sister was terrified of the dark when we were little. And, and she used to never go downstairs. That's why I love being downstairs because she would never go downstairs because it was dark in the hallway down there. And uh, so uh, what about, did you ever think there might be something under the bed or in the closet? Never? No? Okay, well, what scares you? What scares you? Nothing scares you? Wow, you are tough. You are tough. I tell you what, when I was a little boy, I, yeah, I think I think I, I, I think I was scared of monsters or, or whatever. And I, I remember one Christmas, I got I got a monster for Christmas. It was like this little monster, and he had chains on him, and he would break free of the chains and stuff like that. So I was like, oh, cool, I got my own monster that'll tear up the other monsters, right? Well, today we're talking about peace, right? So we talked about joy, we talked about hope, we talked about love, and now we're talking about peace. Do you know what peace is? No? Maybe when we're afraid, and we don't have to be afraid because maybe our mom or our dad or our grandma or grandpa is near, right? And all of a sudden we feel safe. That's peace. And Jesus is kind of the same way. With Jesus near, it brings peace. It doesn't matter what's going on, what kind of situation there is. If Jesus is near to us, we have peace. No matter how crazy the world gets. With Jesus, by us, we have peace. Isn't that great? I think it's great. Would you pray with me? Dear God, thank you so much for your great love. And thank you, Father for bringing us peace. That is your son, Jesus. Amen. Thank you so much, my friend. So today is the Sunday of Advent, which is peace. And the sermon title didn't get written down on here, but it is basically... The advent of peace and the arrival of peace, the Prince of Peace. <clears throat> Let us pray. Almighty God, we pray as we hear your word today that it may do its amazing work of transforming us, continuing to help us to grow into being your people, to train us, to bring us up in strength and knowledge of the Lord, and to ultimately transform us into the image of your Son, Jesus. And we pray also, Father, that if your word today must rebuke, we pray that it does so in love and always brings us into your loving arms. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Amen. So today's first scripture comes from Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 through 7. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6 through 7. And we've probably all heard this before, but I wonder if we've ever meditated on it. It says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of this increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. And he will reign on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish and sustain it with justice and righteousness from that time and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish this. Amen. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen. Now there's really two interesting things in here. Uh, I mean, of course, there's a lot of interesting things as far as the titles of Christ and who Christ is. He is the mighty God with us. He's a wonderful counselor. He's the everlasting father, the prince of peace. But the prince of peace is what I want to look at today. He's called the prince of peace. What does that mean? He says when he establishes his government upon this earth, 
His government will continue to grow, and as it grows, this peace will grow, and there will be no end of this peace in which Christ brings on the earth. And God has promised to accomplish this forevermore. There will be no end to this peace, this peace that Christ brings, this Prince of Peace. Well, that's really encouraging because if you think about it, there's so much conflict in the world. It said that history is written by the victor. What does that mean? History is written by the victor. What victory? Of course, conquest. Most of our history, if you read our history, is of conquest. In fact, all the great novels and all the great things are about war. The Iliad, I mean, the idea of a ten-year Trojan War. And you just go down the line from all the Roman conquests, Alexander the Great and Charlemagne. I mean, you just go down the list. The Hundred Year War. If you even just look at our history, ourselves on this continent, and on this country, just our, our country, we see that our land has, ne has always known war as well. The French and Indian War, of course the American Revolution, then the War of 1812, and about 20, 30, or 40 years later, of course we have the Civil War, and then uh, maybe about 40, 50 years later we have the war that was to end all wars, the Great First World War. And then, of course, we have the Second World War. Then we have Korea. Then Vietnam. Then Desert Storm. And now we just got out of a 20-year war in the Middle East. And now we hear rumors of war with Russia and China. Testing our borders and our allies. I can't think of a time in all of human history where there was extended times of peace. In fact, there, uh, all of human history since the fall has been of conflict. Conflict. I imagine there are generations that could never say we never knew war. It's almost every generation everywhere in the world has known some form of violence and war. Think about in Africa, the apartheid. Think about in some places in Africa, people are killing each other because of some disagreement over grazing rights 200 years ago. And they do atrocities to each other. Just conflict constantly. That's why it's important, this idea of the Prince of Peace, that peace that He will establish that will never end, that will continue to grow and cover the face of the earth. In fact, in some of the prophets writings, they talk about swords being beaten to plowshares and the bow being broken, the spear being broken. <clears throat> Finally, once and for all, peace upon the earth. Could you imagine it? I know it's probably a very difficult thing to imagine. Our second scripture today, Paul outlines who this Prince of Peace is and what he's doing. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 through 18 tells us this. It says, But now in Christ Jesus, you Gentiles, who once were far off, have been brought near in the blood of Christ. For He is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing in His flesh the law of commandments and ordinances, that He might create in Himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby bringing the hostility to an end. And He came and preached peace to you who were far off, and peace to those who were near. For through Him we both have access in one Spirit to the Father. Amen. Yeah. Amen. So, uh, what Paul is saying is that Christ, through this act of love, 
on the cross has brought peace within himself. He has reconciled the Jew and the Gentile, the law and sinners, God and man. He has reconciled it all in his flesh and made us one when we are in Christ. And so there is no conflict because we are one. <clears throat> there are three mentions of the word peace here in that passage here. He is our peace. And Paul's speaking of Christ, and he's made peace, of course, and he says he came to preach peace to those that were far off and those that were near. Again, the Jew and the Gentile, the law and the sinner who couldn't be reconciled. But through Christ, all are reconciled to have peace. Now, I want to underscore for you the fact that this is not a mere doctrine or a mere theology, if you're having conflict with anybody, whether it's in your home, at your work, or in your neighborhood, in the church, or in the world, this is the way of peace. This is the secret of peace. This is the key of peace. We have to understand that Christ is the source of peace, the origin of peace. And what peace truly is. True peace is oneness in Christ. Being one with Christ because in Him all things are reconciled. And so being a part of Christ and Christ being a part of us brings peace. It's not merely the, the ceasing of hostilities or the absence of conflict or violence. It means being one. This is very important to know. Otherwise, when we talk about peace, we're only talking about this superficial idea of people just not fighting. People just not having conflict. Armies laying down their weapons and stopping fighting each other. Now, for us, we would call that peace. And it's certainly preferable over war. That's not the definition God is telling us what peace is. Is it peace when a husband and wife agree not to divorce for the sake of the children, but their home still remains cold and joyless? Well, it may be peace according to the definitions of man, but not according to God. Is it peace when two friends have not spoken to each other in a long time and have decided to agree to disagree and not share each other's company anymore. Not according to God's definition. When a church maintains its rituals and programs, and yet it fills with division and strife and coldness, festering resentment, is that a peaceful church? Not according to this definition. You see, peace is oneness. It's a harmony. It's a connection with the source of peace. That is Jesus Christ. Is being one with Christ as he prayed that great prayer on that night before he was taken to be crucified. May they be one as you and I and the Father are one. May they be one with us and one with each other so that we would have the security and the peace that he brings. As he said, a peace not as the world gives but a peace that transcends the world. Anything else is superficial and temporary. Temporary and highly unsatisfactory. You know this is true. You have made peace in a superficial term when you just agreed not to fight anymore. That's not true peace. If, if you merely agree not to fight, it's not peace. Invariably, it results sooner or later where there's an outbreak of emotion, of conflict, and all the old things are stirred back up, and sure enough, here goes the conflict again. Two armies ceasing deciding they got sick and tired of war and decided not to fight anymore. That's not peace either. That's just we're sick and tired of war, so let us regroup, rearm, and maybe in 20 years we'll be batted again. That's not the peace that God 
desires. The peace that God desires is to make us one in Christ. One with each other. And therefore, therefore reconciling all differences in Him. God desires true peace that only comes through connecting with Christ, being one with Christ. Many, many people come to me as a pastor and they come to me and they uh, ask me uh, to listen to a lot of their issues and their problems and, and I, I love to help in any way that I can. And uh, many of the things are internal conflicts, family conflicts, people arguing, people being cruel to one another. And of course, the person that's coming, they're complaining that they're completely justified in feeling the way that they feel, feeling as angry as they feel because so-and-so did this. But at the end of the day, there are two problems. Not only is this person causing you to rob you of your peace, but you don't have peace. Because if they can rob you of this peace, it's not that transcendent peace that Christ has given to us. Peace surpasses all the chaos of this world. That is the peace that Christ offers. And really, it doesn't really help until a person prays about it and starts to see the result of God moving and, and changing things and looking for that expectation of God working in our lives, working in the situation. And when we see that, we start to feel secure and saying, God, you know, God's there. I don't have to be afraid. I don't have to be angry. God's working in the midst of this situation. He's working in the midst of my life. And you know, in the end result, God's got me. Here or there. I'm secure in Christ. That's a security and a peace that is only known through Jesus. But this is the promise of God to Christians. He's our peace. And once their attitude changes and their hearts are settled, once they put the matter into the hands of the Lord and they see that active God, all of a sudden that peace starts to swell. And finally, Christ came to tear down every barrier. Not only did He tear down the barrier of sin and the law, He tore down the barrier of the Holy of Holies, the curtains, but He also tore down the barrier of the Jew and the Gentile, the Greek and the Jew, the uh, male and the female, just as He tore down the veil that separated the Holy of Holies for all people. God tore it down through Jesus Christ. There was a partition at the temple. So the Jews were tasked with sharing the law with people to reveal what sin is in this, the midst of this world. And yet they still segregated Gentiles into this one little area and they could only see the temple courts. And so there was this three to four foot high wall and the Gentiles were set there. And that's as far as they could go. And on the wall were inscribed these stones that if you leave past this point, you have committed a crime at the penalty of death. And so they, they would take you and they would either stone you to death or uh, some other type of execution. And so it's interesting that, in, in fact, in the year uh, 1871, archaeologists found a part of a remnant of this partition. And they found this, one of the stones that was inscribed uh, with this warning. And it was marked in both Hebrew and Greek. It says, No man, any other race, is to proceed within the partition enclosing the wall about the sanctuary. Anyone arrested there will have himself to blame for the penalty of death, which will be imposed as a consequence. Amen. And yet Christ has tore down this barrier for you. He's tore down the barrier of the Holy of Holies. He's tore down the barrier of sex. He's tore down the barrier of race to bring peace, to reconcile the world. And so now there's no Jew, nor Greek, nor Gentile, nor male, nor female, but we are one in Christ. 
one in purpose and one with each other in Jesus. You know, I find it interesting. The peace that Christ offers is, is so transcendent. You know, you read about stars of Hollywood and you read about CEOs that have billions and they've done all this, but you read about them and all of a sudden you, you, you see a pattern. Some of them drink and drive. They were in a wreck. They're alcoholics. They got to go to some uh, uh, type of treatment or drugs. Why? They literally have all the fame that they could ever want. They have anything that they could manifest uh, physically, they could buy. They could have anything their heart's desires, a mansion, an island, whatever they want. And yet, these are the, some of the most unhappiest people on the planet. You hear about their suicides. You hear about their deaths. You hear about all this. Why? You have everything, right? They, they're missing one thing, and that is peace. That's peace. Without peace. I mean, I, I don't see how you make it through this life. They don't sleep at night. Why? Because they don't have peace. They don't have the peace that only comes through Christ. The peace that only comes by being connected to Christ. And being one in Christ. Only through God is peace possible in this world, in its current state. And he still says that he's coming to ensure that peace remains forever. That's the great promise. The promise of peace. And so if you don't have peace right now, God is saying, come to me. I desire to give you peace. I desire to be in the midst of your situation. And I want to show you that even though all the chaos of the world is happening, I'm right there with you. And you shall have peace even in the midst of the storm. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, we pray for your, your Holy Spirit to come upon us. To remind us of this peace. To grant us this peace. This peace in Christ. Help us to be one with Christ and one to each other. As the church. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen.